Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rick Edelman. Thanks so much for joining us for this webinar. The year ahead in crypto, you're wondering what's going to go on. We're going to answer it for you here today. Joining me on this webinar is Matt Hogan. Matt is the Chief Investment Officer for Bitwise Asset Management. Matt, welcome to our webinar. Thanks for having me, Rick. I'm excited to be here. And Ryan Rasmussen, who is the crypto research analyst uh, focusing on DeFi for Bitwise. Ryan, great to have you with us as well. Great to be here. Thanks. Uh, Ryan uh, has been engaged in this space for a, quite a long time, uh, as you can see here on his bio. Uh, and there's really uh, not a whole lot of folks who are really deep in this space. Ryan is one of those individuals. And Matt's background is very well known. He's one of the world's leading experts on crypto and ETFs, was the CEO of ETF.com. And he helped write the CFA Institute's uh, guide to Crypto Assets, which is uh, an outstanding publication. Uh, so I'm really glad to have both of you here. Before we get started on these uh, predictions that we're going to cover today, Matt, why don't you tell us a little bit about Bitwise? Sure. Thanks so much, Rick. Bit Bitwise is a specialist crypto asset manager. We've been in the market for over five years, and we're best known for two things. Number one, we're the largest crypto index fund provider in the world. We created the first crypto index fund. Now we have a suite of funds available. And number two, we focus on serving the professional investor audience, by which I mean advisors, RIAs, family offices, and institutions. A lot of crypto is retail directed. We're advisor and professional investor directed. And so we like to build products that fits that audience and do research that fits that audience and do webinars like today to help keep people informed on where the crypto market is and where it's going. And in fact, today's webinar is specifically for financial advisors, right in sync, Matt, with what you were just uh, describing. Uh, we have in this uh, webinar today, 10, count them 10, predictions we're going to cover. We may toss in one or two others if we have time. Uh, let me run through all 10 of them for you so that you have an idea of what it is we're specifically going to cover today. And then we'll go backwards and do them all one by one. Prediction number one, uh, what the crypto recovery is going to look like this year? Are we going to emerge from the crypto winter? And if so, what's it going to look like? Pr prediction number two, what are going to be the breakthroughs in the tech itself that are going to shape crypto? Uh, this year and going into next year. Uh, how about Coinbase? They are now one of the most dominant exchanges, certainly here in the United States. What's going to happen to Coinbase? They've had some challenges in the recent past. What's their future looking like? And speaking of prior challenges and future prognostication, Ethereum is our prediction number four. What's next for ETH? And number five, what's next for staking? Number six, this is a very important question because it has a direct impact on portfolio modeling for advisors. Are we going to return to non-correlation? You know, for the first 10 or 12 years, Bitcoin's price was totally uncorrelated to the stock market and every other asset class. But in the past couple of years, it's been very directly correlated to the tech market. Are we going to return to non-correlation? Matt and Ryan are going to tell us that answer. Number seven, what's coming in crypto regulation? Number eight, what's next for stable coins? Number nine, what's next for FTX? And more broadly, what does it mean for the rest of crypto? And finally, number 10, is Coinbase the future that we ought to be paying attention to? Or is it something different? Ryan's going to tell us what that different thing is. So let's launch right into all 10 of these, starting with number one. Matt, I'll begin with you. Talk about the fact that we have been in a crypto winter more than a year. It started uh, at you know, the market peak November of 21. So we're now a year and two months into this horrific environment. Uh, is the crypto winter going to persist? We seem to be thawing with Bitcoin up 40% year to date. Uh, tell us what the crypto winter thawing is going to look like, the crypto recovery. Are we in a recovery? Is this going to last? Is this a dead cat bounce? What's going on? What's going to happen the rest of the year? <laughs> That's a lot, Rick. I'm very excited to tackle all of that. And just hearing those 10 predictions, we're going to cover a lot of ground in this next hour. Uh, the short answer to your question is yes, we are in a recovery. We're at the start of a new bull market for crypto. We think the general direction over the next year, two years, and three years is higher. In fact, for reasons we'll discuss in a bit, we think this is going to be the biggest 
uh, bull market uh, that crypto has experienced, but we don't think it's going to be a straight line up. So January was a wonderful month for everyone. The market went up huge. Bitcoin went up 40%. Coinbase went up something like 70 or 80%. Wonderful. It's not going to be a straight line. There's too much risk in the market. There is still negative overhang from what happened last year. There is regulatory risk in the market. There is headline risk in the market. And as we saw with the Fed and the jobs report, there is still even macro risk in the market. So we think there's going to be a U-shaped recovery, but we do think there's going to be a recovery. We're going to end the year higher than we began. I suspect, hint, feel, we'll end the year higher than we than we uh, are today, but I don't think it will be a straight line. There's risk of downturns. And of course, uh, it's not investment advice. There, there's conditional effects, but that's that's what I see. It is, it's crypto spring. The crocuses are coming out. Uh, but there's still some risk and volatility on the horizon. All right, so l l let me parse a couple of those bits with you, Matt. Uh, it's, it's a U. Uh, I'll begin with that premise. Where on the U are we? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I, I think I think we're probably at the we're probably in the bottom. I don't know that we'll have another leg downward. Although a lot of smart people in crypto think we might even go below the lows we saw. In November, uh, I don't know if I agree with that. I think there's a chance of that. Um, I think we've we we've, we've we're in that bottoming process, and and what that means from return perspective is we're going to have great months like January. We're going to have pullback months. Uh, I don't think we go straight to thirty thousand from here. Um, I think there's a period of sideways volatility before we really get into the the meat of the bull market, and that's what we've seen in crypto past. Right, crypto has historically moved in four year cycles. When it comes out of down years like it did in 2018, like it did in 2014, it doesn't go straight up and to the right. There's too much risk, too much overhang. You'll get a period with, with good returns and mixed returns before eventually you get into uh, the bull market. But well, that's, kind of the, that's kind of the problem with crypto, isn't it? It doesn't do anything unless it does it to excess. Um, <laughs> so, you know, 40% in January. I mean, that's yeah. just, you know unsustainable, right? I mean, uh, I, I, actually it isn't. We had a 1,500% year in 2017. So 40% in a month is really only half of what happened in January of 17. So you could argue that 40% is just so unique to crypto, but it's not outlandish. But are you saying that we're going to have not inside the U, we're going to have a bunch of Ws? Oh, yeah, I don't think it's a straight line. Yeah, I think there'll be some volatility. The, the but the 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 TLDR for an investor in terms of what you do, it doesn't change, right? As you and I know, Rick, crypto should be a small allocation, and you should hold it for the long term. So even though my forecast is that we'll have this sort of volatility, um, I think it's very risky to try to time the market. I think it's very risky to say we'll go up or down in February. I don't know that for sure. I feel much more confident about the long-term trajectory. But yeah, I suspect the U will have valleys and peaks. That's what we've seen again in crypto past. And while history doesn't always repeat itself, it rhymes. And there's reason to be optimistic about crypto and reason to be worried. And that usually results in good and bad headlines. And that usually translates into good and bad performance. And I think I think we're likely to see that kind of volatility before we we really enter the next major phase up. But I think we're getting there. And so tell me why you think this isn't a dead cat bounce. Uh, why this 40% increase in January is the beginning of the, of the new crypto spring. Yeah, look, if you look at crypto, not on a minute by minute basis, but on a cycle by cycle basis, you'll realize the story that crypto is dead was just vastly oversold in December. If you look at where crypto was at the end of 2022 versus the end of the last bear market in 2018, prices are up 500%, developer counts are up 125%, Ethereum revenue is up 2,500%, stable coins are up an infinite amount, DeFi is up an infinite amount. The industry is so much more robust today than it was at the bottom of the last cycle, that people who assumed it was just fizzling out to nothing were not looking at data. And so when you look at data, the reason I'm confident we've turned the corner is those fundamental statistics are growing again, wallet addresses are growing again, fees are growing again, the level of developer activity is, is looking very strong. Uh, and that just tells me crypto is not going away and we, we, we've entered this bull market period again.
And that's actually a really good segue to prediction number two. Ryan, uh, this prediction is about the technological breakthroughs that are going to shape crypto in 2023 and beyond. What, give us some predictions. What are those tech breakthroughs that Bitwise is talking about? Yeah, th this is a really interesting prediction. It, it definitely follows up on what Matt was talking about, where the fundamentals are really strong, but the underlying technology is also transforming at a really impressive rate. Uh, what we're really excited about for 2023 and going forward is that crypto's you know, original promise of essentially free and extremely fast transactions should finally become a reality in 2023. And that's thanks to the tech upgrades that we've seen a lot of these core development teams make over the past year, two years, three years, even though we had had this crazy kind of roller coaster of, a, a, of price swings. And so those tech breakthroughs really relate to, to scaling uh, blockchain technology and, and the layer two scaling solutions, which basically sit on top of, of Ethereum and other blockchains and make them faster to use, uh, cheaper to use, and just improve the throughput. So there's two tech improvements that have happened over the last cycle that we think are gonna unlock a lot of crypto use cases and a lot of potential in the next cycle. And it's something that a lot of the market is broadly missing, which, which we find really interesting. And those are the, uh, the, the rise of layer two scaling solutions. These are generally uh, the most popular ones are Arbitrum and Optimism and Polygon. These are layer two scaling solutions that sit on top of a layer one blockchain and essentially handle a bunch of transactions, roll those up and then settle those back to the, the original layer. That means they can process thousands, tens of thousands of more transactions at once or in a short amount of time before settling those back to the, the, the canonical chain. And also it means that the cost to transact on these layer twos is going to go down dramatically. And so the use cases that unlocks is really interesting. Uh, we have in this we have this uh, estimate that you know the transaction cost should should reduce by about a hundred x. Uh, following these upgrades, the, the rise of layer two is another improvement that Ethereum uh, ecosystem is implementing this year. It's called EIP 4844. That's just a kind of a, a technological term for an Ethereum improvement proposal. And that's going to unlock just, just transactions on layer twos um, at, at a huge level compared to what we see today. And so you can imagine the use cases around crypto getting really exciting when it goes from Five dollars, ten dollars, to you know, even down to five cents, even down to a one hundredth of a penny to to execute transactions. That unlocks a lot of the uh, possibilities for crypto. So, what you're describing is the core technology, the foundation that makes this stuff work. But what you haven't addressed is how that tech gets out of the lab and into the marketplace. So, give me one example, just one of a use case, a commercial application that will benefit from that technological innovation you've just described. Yeah, definitely. One great use case that uh, that we're looking forward to is kind of the uh, the unlock of of media in like a in, in a way that users can really interact with with media, whether that's written content or viewer content or even like podcasts um, in a way where they're not paying for a monthly or annual subscription that's very costly and. And you know, these days streaming services and all other types of content providers can get really expensive when they start to stack onto each other. But when you have the cost of a transaction down in the fractions of a penny, like perhaps that unlocks business models where you can pay as you view or pay for the content that you're actually consuming when you're consuming it. And that not only unlocks uh, a lot of capabilities for viewers to have more choices and more freedom to explore new content, uh, new media, but it also unlocks the, the possibilities for creators to connect with consumers and with viewers in a way they've never been able to before. So we're really excited about that use case. And uh, Matt, you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to build on how big a deal this is and make a, a metaphor or an analogy for you. If you remember in the early days of, of cell phones, every call cost $5 and you couldn't put any data through the pipes. And then the cost for a call fell to effectively zero and the bandwidth increased 100,000 fold. The same thing is happening with blockchains right now. The cost to do a transaction was $20 at the peak, or even sometimes $200 for a single transaction at the peak of the last bull market. That's going by the end of this year, we think, to less than a penny. And the number of transactions you could process was maybe a dozen or 15 per second, and that's going to thousands per second. The scale of this innovation is akin to the scale of cell phones being in your car to having this iPhone or akin to going from dial-up modem 
to broadband that we enjoy today. And the, the, the resulting applications, Ryan pointed out, uh, individual payments for individual articles, but micropayments, decentralized social gaming applications, all of those are possible when the cost to transact is a fraction of a penny, and they simply weren't possible beforehand. And that's the scale of this thing that we're talking about. And just a little bit of a uh, sneak uh, preview, this concept of use cases, the commercial application of the technology deserves its own webinar. And we're gonna deliver it to you in the next month or so. You'll hear about it over uh, the next several weeks as we nail down the date. Um, so watch for that because we're gonna devote an entire webinar to the commercial application affecting dozens, hundreds, thousands of industries around the world. It's gonna be a really exciting event, so stay tuned for that. Uh, related to all of this and the use cases and commercial application and, and increased user activity is Coinbase. These the Coinbase is now the elephant in the room uh, here in the US. So Ryan, that's prediction number three. Tell us what is going to happen to Coinbase. They paid a $100 million fine last year. Uh, what's gonna happen yeah. next? Yeah, Coinbase is, is really a fascinating business. Uh, not only have they have they really jumped to the forefront of the centralized exchange sector with the, the collapse of FTX and other kind of centralized uh, crypto companies over the past year, but their business is growing at a really impressive rate, despite anything that may or may not be happening with the price and market cap uh, of the company. And so what we think is fascinating, what our prediction was for 2023, is that the market cap of Coinbase will double from where in 2023 from where it closed 2022. And I'm happy to report we've had some uh, some positive traction uh, on that prediction thus far this year, as, as we talked about assets are really up a lot in January. Crypto equities uh, are, are up tremendously. But the interesting about the thing about Coinbase is that the fundamentals of the business have improved dramatically since uh, since the last cycle, since 2018. We've seen net revenue increase nearly 5x. We've seen uh, you know usership on the platform increase nearly 5x. And yet the market cap, the price, is at about the same level it was in 2018. So what that tells us is that despite the the market. Um, selling off dramatically in the face of macro headwinds and crypto specific headwinds last year, the underlying business of Coinbase really, really grew at it is growing at an impressive rate and has grown tremendously since 2018, despite it ending 2022 at a very similar uh, market cap. So we think it's a sleeping giant. Uh, you know, it has more than 100 million users. It has a massive brand that only its brand re reputation and value only increases in the face of all the chaos we've seen in the past year. And it's based in the US. It operates within US regulatory framework. It's involved with USDC, which is you know one of the leading uh, stable coins, and so yeah, we're really really uh, impressed by what Coinbase has done and how how much has grown uh, their business. So uh, Coinbase was the second company to pay a massive fine like that. The first one was BlockFi, put them out of business. Ultimately, um, you're not concerned that's going to happen to Coinbase. No, you know, Coinbase is is a really strong company and, and they did get fined for, uh, I believe it was some compliance related issues that they, they had going on. But uh, ultimately, you know, it was a big number. But I think given the, the amount of cash flow that business generates, uh, it's, it's more of a slap on the on the wrist. And uh, I think Coinbase has a real desire to quickly comply with regulations in, you know, in as best as possible to separate themselves from the pack. Matt, there's a statistic you love to cite about Coinbase in terms of its size, uh, relatively speaking, the, the number of accounts. Matt Ryan said there's 100 million customers of Coinbase. Give us uh, the, the comparison of what that means relative to some other big firms. You do know I love this, Rick. It's more than Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, E-Trade, and Interactive Brokers combined. And I think that's a really important fact. People underestimate the scale of uh, retail penetration amongst crypto, and they do it against the objective data of what's true. As Ryan said, this is an enormous brand with enormous scale and an enormous embedded user base of relatively wealthy, relatively young customers. It's got tremendous value. Coin, uh, uh, Charles Schwab was invented uh, in 1975 as a result of a change in legislation that we refer to today as May Day, May 1st, when the government deregulated 
brokerage commissions. And that allowed Charles Schwab to invent the very first discount brokerage firm. And he invented an entirely new category of investment uh, methodology, uh, which is why Schwab remains today uh, such an incredibly impactful company. That was 1975. Uh, remind us when Coinbase was founded? Uh, that was 2012. Coinbase came into the market. So yeah. Uh, the company is, you know, just a little better than a than a decade old, and is uh, massively bigger than Schwab, uh, despite its fifty year history. So that tells you something uh, about what's going on in this business. Now, one of the things that Coinbase uh, finds itself engaging in more than hardly anything, uh, the the top two are uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. They're the two biggest coins, the two most frequently traded as a result. So uh, Coinbase does a lot of business with Ethereum. And Ethereum, we have to unpack into two parts. It reflects two of your predictions. Uh, first, what's next for Ethereum, uh, Matt? And then after that, what's next for staking, which is a big part of Ethereum these days. So let's start first, Matt, with Ethereum itself. What's going to, What's coming next for Ethereum? Yeah, we think Ethereum is the crypto asset of the year. Uh, although there are a few that might challenge it, uh, so maybe maybe Polygon, maybe some of the layer two solutions. Uh, but there's a lot going on in Ethereum. Ryan mentioned earlier EIP 4844, which is going to reduce the cost of transacting on Ethereum uh, significantly. It's also going through the, the Shanghai upgrade, uh, which is going to, um, uh, Ryan will talk about this, but change the way staking works. But the biggest change to Ethereum in my view, actually happened last year when it went from proof of work to proof of stake. The so-called merge. The so-called merge is the most complicated, decentralized open source software upgrade ever. And it did two really important things, right? It reduced its carbon consumption by 99%, but it also changed the issuance profile of it. And by issuance, I mean how much new Ethereum is issued each day by the blockchain to continue to exist. Uh, that used to inflate the amount of Ethereum supply by 3 or 4% a year. And our prediction is this year, the total amount of Ethereum that exists in the world will actually decline by 1%. So we're now at the point where Ethereum is consuming more Ethereum every day than is being produced. People are using the network so much that more is being destroyed than is being produced. So it's becoming more scarce, which should make it be more valuable. For people who have been in the market, you might remember the days of people forecasting peak oil. Uh, this is peak Ethereum. We think there will never be more Ethereum in the world than there is today. It will be an increasingly scarce resource that's increasingly in demand. And we're not sure the market has fully priced that in yet. So let's let's back up a sec and, and talk about why this matters. Why are we even emphasizing Ethereum? Uh, it's the number two coin by market cap. Why is Ethereum a big deal? Contrast it to Bitcoin. Sure. Yeah, it's a smart contract platform. So it's a completely different thing from Bitcoin. Bitcoin is, many people believe, digital gold, but it's not a coin with utility, right? You can't program Bitcoin to act like the New York Stock Exchange or program Bitcoin to run a decentralized social network or program Bitcoin to process loans. All it's really good at is storing wealth in a secure decentralized format. Now, I think that's a massive use case. I think it has massive upside, but you're never going to build a new internet or a new financial services ecosystem on Bitcoin. Ethereum was developed after Bitcoin. It looked at Bitcoin and said, what if we could program it the way we can program JavaScript or Python or websites? What if we could program it to do anything? So Ethereum is a programmable, global, decentralized supercomputer that people are using to re-architect parts of the web, the financial services sector, social sector, we think the gaming sector. Um, and so that's why it's interesting. And the, the beautiful thing as an investor is in order to make this supercomputer run, you have to pay a fee in Ethereum. And that Ethereum is consumed as part of that process. And that's what I mean. So many people are paying this fee and so little new Ethereum is being created that Ethereum is now getting scarcer day by day month by month, and we believe year by year. And that should be supportive to prices over time because you have a scarce asset that's increasingly in demand in the market. Ethereum also uh, addresses uh, a fundamental, I don't know if it's a flaw or a criticism, but it's a fundamental fact 
of crypto, uh, by its nature, Bitcoin, when it was invented, uh, featured only one element of wealth creation. Uh, and we're all kind of used to this uh, because we all grew up in the stock market, that there are two ways you make money in stocks. Growth, of course, you hope that the stock will rise in value, but about half of the profits of the stock market over the last 100 years comes not from growth, but from dividends. Uh, and people tend to kind of sometimes forget that fact. We, we know how important income is. That's the claim to fame of bonds, of course. Even real estate, it's not just the growth and value of the property, it's the rental income that you get from real estate. The problem with Bitcoin is that it doesn't offer an income component. Um, you buy Bitcoin on the hope that it'll rise in price, but that's all there is to it. Ethereum, because it has now moved to the proof of stake platform, now creates the potential for staking, which is an income generating activity. So Ryan, talk about what staking is for those watching this who may not be familiar uh, and why staking matters uh, and what is in the future of staking uh, as your prediction. Yeah, that you nailed it right on the head. That's one of the core differences. And one of the things that we're most excited about the, the, the Ethereum with the merge that happened last year is this transition and movement away from proof of work to proof of stake. So with Bitcoin and with proof of work, uh, in order to validate transactions, people would buy Bitcoin mining rigs and plug them in and start mining transactions and validate the network. That, that used a lot of energy and it was rather expensive to do. And if you were selected, you would get a, you would get a reward, but only one person was selected for that reward per block. With proof of stake and with Ethereum and with this transition that happened in the past, uh, past six months or so, you no longer have to be mining Bitcoin and using all this energy and expensive equipment to participate in, in the Ethereum network. Instead, what users do is stake their capital or deposit their capital kind of in a backstop contract against the network. And that is part of the consensus mechanism that's used as transactions are validated in securing the network. And then each time a transaction is executed, those that are, you know, if I'm making a trade or if I'm buying an NFT or um, you know, some other future use case, I'm paying a small transaction fee and that's flowing through to those stakers and they're sharing in that reward. And so, yeah, it very much changed the dynamics of the Ethereum network from uh, this very energy intensive, expensive, you know, somewhat low, uh, low payout reward mechanism proof of work into a dividend like structure where you uh, deposit or stake your capital as they call it. And uh, every time there's a fee paid, a little portion of that is dividended back to the stakers. And uh, it's, it's really exciting. Another really exciting element of it is that it's only been live in the bear market. So the merge occurred in September of last year when markets uh, you know, have been selling off and have seen little activity. But as there's more activity on the network, the APY or the yield you get and earn from staking is only you know, going to, to grow from where it was um, likely and, and, you know, gets better and better for those that are staking. So it's a really, really interesting transition. It also unlocks the ESG narrative. So there's a lot of investors who have been, you know, staying away from Bitcoin because it has such a uh, negative, you know, ESG connotation. And that essentially went away overnight with Ethereum's transition uh, to proof of stake. So what kind of yields can people reasonably expect to get from staking? Uh, when when staking began about um, about December 2020, uh, the yields were much higher than they are today. Uh, you know, double digits potentially. Now we see the range of about four to eight percent yield, and uh, would expect that it flows somewhere uh, in that room. And depending on which staking service provider you use, maybe they take more fees out of that yield or or less fees, so it can kind of vary. But about four to eight percent yield issued in the native token. So it's not. It's important to note it's issued in ETH. It's not issued uh, in, you know, in U.S. dollars. Um, but obviously, you could then convert that to U.S. dollars and realize those gains. Okay, so four to eight percent is a pretty broad spread. Um, we all know the greater the return, the greater the risk. So tell me why somebody would be paying four percent yields to stakers versus eight uh, percent to help us understand which should I go after? Because otherwise, I'll just choose the eight percent guy, right? So tell me. What am I? What am I paying in risk, you know, and am I paying in risk to get that higher staking reward? Yeah, you definitely are going to have some trade off with the different providers you use and the, and the way they charge fees. Uh, what What's interesting about the crypto dynamic is like the more decentralized 
of a service provider that you use, the higher the fees kind of are in some cases. And so people are paying to have zero dependency on like an intermediary. Whereas uh, if I were to go use Coinbase, for example, or, um, a, you know, Kraken or another centralized kind of staking company, because Coinbase does offer uh, staking services along with trading and other business lines. Um, I'm doing that, but I'm kind of trusting them with my assets in a way. And that's, I'm going to, uh, have less of a difficulty just getting up and running with staking, but I'm probably not going to pay as much of a fee because I'm taking on a little bit, a little bit more risk by trusting them. Whereas if I use a decentralized staking option like Lido, which is a DeFi protocol that anyone can go and stake their assets in, in two clicks and you can, you know, query and view everything on chain that's happening with your assets in real time, uh, they might have, um, you know, a bit, a bit higher of a fee uh, because of everything that it requires in the back end for them to provide that, that service. So, it really just depends on yeah how much you want to trust centralized entities, how much you want to be involved in the staking process, whether you just want to set it and forget it, or if you want to uh, participate and actually run these these staking nodes on your own, in which case you can earn a little bit higher of reward, but but there's a little bit of risk to it as well. So definitely a trade off. So it's worth learning about staking because you know I've done the math. Most of us have in this space, and over a ten year period, staking can double your returns. Um, depending on the growth of ETH and, and the staking reward. So you need to evaluate, is staking for me? Do I, am I comfortable with the risks? Do I understand the different platforms available on which I can stake? Do I have the long-term time horizon to leave my coins there to be staked because there are often liquidity restrictions, et cetera. Um, but it is definitely something uh, to strongly uh, look at because like we said, I'm not sure if you'd put 100% of your stock portfolio into non-dividend paying stocks. Uh, and by the same notion, I don't think you'd buy real estate that didn't have rental income. Uh, and so think about the implications of buying crypto that doesn't offer income potential. Um, so be aware of all that, all the above, and recognize staking uh, is increasingly a thing in the world uh, of crypto. There's another thing, Matt, that I want us to talk about. Um, you do uh, at Bitwise uh, a survey every year of financial advisors. It's one of the most important surveys in the crypto industry because it really gets to the pulse of what advisors are thinking uh, about this industry. And if I go back to your surveys of several years ago, um, one of the questions you ask all the time is, why do you like crypto for those who do like it? Why, why are you, uh, what's the primary or, or dominant reason that you uh, believe that crypto belongs in a portfolio? And for a long time, the number one reason, as you know, Matt, the number one reason that advisors said they liked adding crypto to a portfolio was not because they thought crypto would grow in value dramatically, but because crypto was non-correlated. That if we compare the price performance of Bitcoin to all other asset classes, stocks, bonds, gold, oil, commodities, foreign assets, you name it, there was no relationship between Bitcoin and any of the others, making it a wonderful addition to improve portfolio diversification. I mean, it's Harry Markowitz on steroids. Um, that story ended in the fall of 21, when crypto began to track the stock market generally and the NASDAQ specifically. So talk about why it stopped uh, being a non-correlated asset. Why did it start correlating? And answering the big question, your prediction number six, are we going to return? to non-correlation, which was a huge motivation for people to buy crypto. Yeah, absolutely. This is one of our, our, our strongest predictions and uh, one that's a little bit out of consensus, but I have high conviction in. Um, we are going to return to the historical norm of crypto being having a low correlation to the equity market. The period we went through was really stretched from the start of COVID until maybe the end of 2022, um, was the anomalous period. It's the only period in crypto's history where the correlation between Bitcoin and equities has been above 0.5. Uh, all of the rest of time, it's been below 0.5. And why did it happen? Because crypto is driven by a couple of different factors, right? It's driven by 
crypto specific factors, progress in regulation, progress in technology, progress in use case, but it's also a risk asset. Crypto is a technology that is still maturing and would be more valuable in the future. So like other risk assets, it's influenced by the macro environment. Now that's been true throughout the history of crypto, but we have lived through a regime over the last two years where that all that mattered was the Fed. Didn't matter how many cars Tesla sold, Tesla stock was trading based on the Fed. It didn't matter you know, how JP Morgan was doing in terms of converting customers at Chase. What mattered was what the Fed was doing. And the same thing was true with Bitcoin. So from COVID to November, massive run up in all risk assets because there was infinite QE, zero interest rates. In November of 2021, the Fed began uh, raising interest rates and doing quantitative tightening for the first time in many decades, an apocal shift, huge flows. And of course, during that period, all risk assets are going to be correlated. But we know that macro is going to play a smaller role influencing the market in 2023 than it did in 2022. We're now talking about 25 basis point increments at the Fed, not 75 basis points. We're talking about a known path of quantitative tightening, not an unknown path of what will the Fed do. And so we think crypto specific factors are going to return to the fore. And in fact, in January, we already saw this. Crypto's correlation to the S&P 500 fell back down towards its historical range. We think that will persist for the remainder of the year. Look, you don't have to overthink this. Are the drivers of crypto different than the drivers of stock? Is what drives Ethereum different than what drives Costco? And the answer to that is objectively yes. And if the answer to that is yes, then in normal conditions, you'll have low correlations. That's what we've had historically, and that's where we're returning to this year. So the you began your commentary by saying that you are not um, that your prediction is out of sync with the most folks on Wall Street. Yeah. Uh, and the general attitude from folks I talk to is that the correlation story was predicated on the fact that in Bitcoin's early days, it wasn't Wall Streeters who were buying Bitcoin. It was the anarchists. It were the techies. It were the folks who were, you know, playing with the development tools back in the early 2010s. Uh, but now we have institutional engagement, and the institutional investors are the Wall Streeters, uh, the the pension funds, the endowments, the uh, uh, sovereign funds, and and so on. And they, to your point, Matt, are trading crypto the way they trade tech stocks indiscriminately. They're not paying much attention. And that, and so the most folks are saying that trend is not going to change. But Ryan, um, support or contradict Matt, you <laughs> feel that the this recent past, uh, COVID to the present, was a short-term aberration, nothing reflecting long-term trends, yes or no? Yeah, I, I do agree with Matt that that the past two years have really just been an anomaly for the high correlations between crypto and equities. I mean, there's definitely some truth to the fact that in the early days and, and probably up until this last cycle, we haven't had a lot of institutional buying and selling going on. And so the the, the big uh, disconnect in correlations is likely in part due, due to that. Um, and so we did see, especially as as crypto got a little bit older, those correlations like peak a little bit, but there was always these periods where it was going up and down, uh, kind of in that W that you referenced earlier until COVID hit. And since then, we've just had this rising correlation, uh, you know, for all risk assets. If you if you look at, uh, you know, where prices really start, price movements really started to converge for crypto and equities, it really happened around 2020. And uh, we're really excited, yeah, that, that, that likely will become more of a back burner as like the crypto specific drivers are realized by institutional investors and they stop trading them similar to other equities and start trading them, uh, you know, more like the, the early stage uh, kind of tech startups that they are, but being priced in real time. Yeah, when, when I saw the correlation story eroding, as we all did uh, from COVID to uh, the end of last year, and we saw the coincident increase in institutional activity in crypto, and we saw the institutions selling crypto the way they were selling tech stocks uh, during last year's bear, my attitude was these institutional investors, they didn't get the memo. Bitcoin is non-correlated. Nobody obviously told them that. And so I think they're now realizing a little late and after the fact, 
they shouldn't have been selling crypto the way they were selling the NASDAQ um, because the two have nothing to do with each other. So I, I tend to agree with you that the correlation aberration was in fact a short-term thing. I, I think you're you're right about that. I think right. these traders are going to get with the program and realize that they were applying a stock market attitude to a non-stock market asset, and they'll realize the folly of their ways. However, speaking of institutions, there uh, you know we've all been waiting anxiously for greater institutional engagement. We're beginning to see it in a big way, but it's not yet where. Um, they are with stocks, for example. Every institution is a very large equity allocation. That breadth and depth in crypto isn't yet quite in place. One of the reasons, perhaps the dominant reason, that we hear institutions saying they aren't yet fully into crypto is because they're saying they don't know what the rules of the road are. They're not sure if they're allowed. They're not sure what the reporting requirements are. They're not sure what the regulations and legislative rules are. So that's your prediction number seven. What's coming, Matt, with crypto regulation in 2023? Yeah, more is the answer, Rick. More regulation is what's coming. You're absolutely right. This is what keeps people on the sidelines. Every year in that survey you referenced, we ask people, what's keeping you on the sidelines? Five years in a row, the number one thing was not volatility. I don't understand crypto. I don't know how to value it. What are the use cases? Five years in a row, the number one thing was regulation. And we are going to get regulation. We're going to get regulation and we're going to get legislation. And legislation is actually even more important because mm -hmm. the rules of the road aren't well defined, right? The way the American system is, we write legislation that writes the rules and then regulators interpret it. One of the reasons progress has been so challenging is that the rules were written 80 years ago and we're trying to apply them to digital assets. We think there'll be at least one major piece of stablecoin legislation passed this year. For the first time ever, we have a House subcommittee on digital assets. We think easy targets for regulation or new legislation are going to be rules around stablecoins to make them more secure and rules around crypto exchanges to start to separate trading from custody, uh, which would prevent situations like FTX. Those are going to be great. I will say, as you see these regulatory headlines, you're going to see crypto Twitter lose its mind and complain about it and talk about the end of times. But as an investor, you should realize that this is going to be good for crypto. If what you want is for crypto to matter in the mainstream, you need more regulation. So ignore the crypto Twitter rot and focus on what's real, which is the more regulation is going to bring more investors in. It's going to help it matter. You know, institutional professional investors are really good at making money no matter the environment, no matter the rules. No rules have ever stopped us from profiting. Uh, what we don't like, you know, tell me good, tell me bad, but tell me what we don't like is the lack of knowing. Uh, you know, I, I'll drive whatever speed you want on the highway. Just tell me the speed limit. Uh, <laughs> without knowing the speed limit, I'm afraid I'll get pulled over, you know, regulation by enforcement, which we all love to hate in, the, in our industry. So I think you're absolutely right about that, that rules are uh, clarity of rules is better than lack of clarity. And I, I fully agree that this is the only silver lining coming out of FTX. It's spurring Washington to move faster uh, with a greater sense of urgency. So I think you're absolutely right. Um, Ryan, one of the other technological innovations uh, and an area of regulatory attention as well is not the, the volatile digital assets like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and NFTs, but stable coins, uh, an entirely separate element of the ecosystem that many people feel ultimately is bigger than anything else. So What's next for stablecoins? We saw Terra Luna blow up last year. Um, right. What's next? Yeah, stablecoins are a really interesting area of crypto, even though they aren't as uh, crazy volatile or aren't intended to be as volatile as the other uh, assets that get a lot more coverage. You know, it's one of crypto's killer apps uh, that has seen basically uh, nonstop traction since they, they came to market. And our prediction around stablecoins for 2023 is that USDC will surpass USDT, also known as Tether, as the world's largest stablecoin. And the reasoning behind that kind of feeds into what we were just talking about around uh, the need for investors to uh, have some sort of regulatory guidelines to operate within. And USDC is the uh, is a crypto backed stable or, or an asset backed stablecoin rather than an algorithmic stablecoin. So unlike the Luna. Uh, uh, UST situation where it was backed by volatile crypto assets. 
USDC is backed by uh, cash and US treasuries and other kind of short duration instruments and, and uh, held by third party uh, custodians or a lot of the uh, reserves for USDC is actually invested with BlackRock, funny enough. Um, so really a more kind of trusted and regulated environment. And we think that's one reason why USDC will surpass USDT this year. Uh, USDT is an offshore stable coin that is largely operated outside of regulatory frameworks since its inception. And, uh, and because of that, it's starting to lose some of its market share to USDC, especially in the face of the uh, you know, CFI credit crisis and, and FTX implosion that we saw here. We're seeing investors, stablecoin users, especially in times of volatility, rush to the stablest of stablecoins, uh, if you will, which you know, obviously are those that sit within a regulatory framework that is um, a little bit more enforceable and, and known than outside of the US. So really excited about stablecoins. There's over 130 billion uh, of assets allocated to stablecoins. And so uh, it's a really, really interesting and growing market. So what's agreed, do you think, or when do you think uh, it's going to enter the daily conversation for advisors? That's a good question. You know, stablecoins are used for a variety of things. They're used, uh, you know, for sending or just receiving funds so that you don't have to worry about price fluctuations in between uh, redemption or sending. They're also uh, used as, you know, a store value, even outside of the, the digital gold store value that we talk about with Bitcoin. Um, and in this, this times of moving risk off in crypto markets, it's, it's easier for a lot of investors to just move into USDC instead of moving out of the crypto ecosystem entirely. So I think this next cycle, we'll see a lot more activity centered around uh, stable coins than in the past. I think we've seen uh, investors kind of exit markets entirely in the past when things have sold off and when and the crypto cycle has gone into that boom phase. But I think with the with the rise of U.S. based stable coins, uh, the the firm behind USDC, uh, known as Circle, they also operate the stable coin with Coinbase. Uh, they were set to go go public uh, this year and in in the U.S. And so I think that you know as as a U.S. based stable coin becomes more and more popular in use and uh, more embedded in the ecosystem. And as the industry matures, instead of going risk off, people just go straight into stables, maybe earn some yield there. So I think in the next year or two, we're really going to see a lot of a lot of uh, growth in, in the rise of stable coins in the daily vocab uh, of advisors. We mentioned earlier FTX. It's your number nine prediction. What's next for FTX? I'm going to uh, ask you to uh, also answer, does anybody care about FTX anymore? Um <laughs> As, as horrible good, as it was, uh, Matt, yeah, uh, talking as it was, does it matter anymore? And what's next? I mean, the media still cares about it, so it's still making headlines. But I agree that the industry has moved past it, right? FTX was not a crypto issue. Uh, it was a, uh, a historic fraud. And so to the extent that it matters is only the extent that there are cascading impacts. And the question is, are we through those cascading impacts? Now, we saw uh, a sort of a, a, a piece of it continue with Genesis's bankruptcy, which you could argue was influenced in part by the collapse of FTX. Um, so there is this worry that there are still uh, shoes to drop. I think Genesis may be the last big shoe to drop in that process. So, And let's, let's elaborate on that because we have several questions from folks, and this came up twice about Genesis, about Digital Currency Group, about Grayscale. Um, okay. Put it all together with FTX. Sure. I mean, Genesis was a crypto lending company. So they borrowed money from institutional investors and lent it to other people, playing the role of effectively a prime broker in the crypto market. And uh, they made some bad loans. They made some bad loans and they had some assets parked on FTX that got seized and they got crushed in the Luna collapse. And then uh, they were already down and then they got kicked while they were down because they had exposure to FTX as well. And so uh, it couldn't make good on its loans. And so it's gone into bankruptcy. It's really sort of as simple as that, right? It, it, it had exposure to these things that had poor underwriting practices. And as a result, the entity has collapsed. Now, again, what matters there is really the second order effects, which is who is harmed by this. Uh, there was news that Gemini's earn customers, which were mostly retail customers, were entangled in the Genesis party because Gemini had loaned money to Genesis. It sounds like they've worked out a process outside of the bankruptcy court to help pay back those investors, which is wonderful news. Um, 
Beyond that, we haven't seen liquidity collapse in the ecosystem. People were worried about that. Uh, I think the market is digesting this well. One thing crypto does well uh, is it clears through these negative events, right? In the traditional financial system, there probably would have been bailouts. It would have had a longer shelf life. Maybe it would have been less volatile, but gone on for longer. Crypto is very volatile because there is no equivalent bailout procedure, but it does clean, cleanse the system. And that's what we're seeing here. And we're, we're at the tail end of that process. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the silver lining is that it's getting Washington to act, just like Bernie Madoff succeeded in getting uh, Congress and the SEC to do a better job in consumer protection in the stock market. FTX, at the end of the day, will end up with better consumer protection in the crypto market. So we'll We'll hope uh, that that proves true. Uh, and number 10, prediction number 10, Ryan, you talked a lot earlier about Coinbase uh, and why you and Matt are so bullish uh, on this company and why it's a big deal. But now, actually, prediction number 10, you're saying forget Coinbase. It ain't all about Coinbase. It's about... It's about Uniswap as well. Yes, that, that's very right. It, it's uh, We do have to square off this prediction that Uniswap, the leading decentralized exchange, will trade more volume then Coinbase will uh, in Q4 2023 with our prediction from earlier that Coinbase market cap will likely double. We definitely think both are possible and I'll, and I'll tell you why. Uh, it, wait, there's wait, room for both. I want to explain to people what Uniswap is. Nobody's ever heard of Uniswap. So uh, that hurts my heart, but I'm happy, happy to do it nonetheless. Uh, Uniswap is a decentralized exchange that so facilitates the same type of trading as you can do on Coinbase or uh, traditional exchanges. However, you're not trading with a market maker, you're trading with like a smart contract or a decentralized application that has coded the pricing and the transacting of those assets into it naturally. And so uh, when I go and I make a trade on Uniswap, I'm trading against the pool of liquidity that other crypto users have deposited and I'm swapping tokens in and out of that liquidity pool. Um, it's a really fascinating model for a few reasons. I'm, but first of all, there's about you know 30 contributors to Uniswap around the world, and it's processing billions of dollars in trading volume a day. And at some points, it's surpassed Coinbase in the amount of trading volume that it's processed in given days and months. Um, even this last November, Uniswap surpassed Coinbase in monthly trading volume. And we all know Coinbase is a large company that has offices around the world, has over a thousand employees. And I think this is just such a powerful example of how decentralized finance and and decentralized crypto applications can just leverage the, the network effect and leverage the public infrastructure that is, you know, Ethereum and other blockchains to scale their business and to remove the uh, the borders and the um, digital or real borders that are put up between transacting uh, in assets and right now digital assets, but you know, eventually tokenized assets that are that we all uh, trade in traditional medium today. And so, yeah, we're really excited about about what Uniswap does. They've been uh, they've been you know, a market leader for a few years now, but uh, it, we've yet to see them really uh, overcome a centralized trading venue for a long period of time, uh, just because there has been so much, uh, so much early market share for those, those centralized venues that started, you know, way back when. But Uniswap came to rise in 2017, really didn't see its first amount of traction to 2020. And like I said, in November, it already surpassed Coinbase and trading volume. And so uh, it's, it's just a really, really beautiful business model. Yeah, I'm a really big fan of Uniswap. I have a pair of Uni socks uh, that they originally ah, issued 500 pair. Love and so, that. Yeah, I'm a big fan of them, and and the fact that nobody's ever heard of them is remarkable. And, you know, so few people, to your point earlier, recognize the incredible size of Coinbase with 100 million customers, and Uniswap is going to be bigger uh, on a DeFi, on a DeFi platform. I think it is worth advisors looking into Uniswap to understand this better. Uh, really terrific info. Now, we have a lot of questions that have come up and a lot of folks have a lot of curiosity about all this. I want to let you know that uh, Bitwise offers um, something that very few organizations in the crypto field offer, and that is a comprehensive array of business developers and internal sales team. Matt, how many do you now have on your Biz dev team nationally? I mean, it's 25 or 26. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's unheard of. I mean, some of the biggest, you know, ETF companies in the nation don't have that many. Uh, you know, so often we, you know, you, you call uh, some 800 number, if they even offer that, you get a chat bot or you have to send an email to an anonymous service at NUCO. 
There are dozens of people at Bitwise. You can individually call on screen. You see uh, the um, names and phones and emails of all these different folks. It's hard to read uh, the six point font. We're going to post in the chat uh, this link. We will also send it to you as a uh, individual who is here with us today and registered for this event. We will send you this uh, this uh, uh, doc so that you can reach out locally to uh, a Bitwise executive who is in the sole business of helping you grow your business. Matt, you, anything you want to elaborate on this team? No, just that they're all uh, trained professionals in the crypto market, as well as the traditional finance industry. And their real role is to help you answer questions, whether you're buying a product or not. If you get a question from a client about crypto or you want to understand what's going on, this is yet another resource that you can reach out to. And they, they'd love to chat. And uh, as I mentioned, go hit that chat button right now. You'll get the link to this uh, page so that you can um, take a look at it and, and grab that. Uh, I also want to let you know that if you want to really get a deep dive and most importantly, be able to demonstrate to your clients that you've gotten a deep dive, you're now fluent in crypto, get your certificate in blockchain and digital assets. Uh, this is the oldest and still largest individual uh, independent certificate program in this space. It's an online self-study course with a world-class faculty. Thousands of financial advisors have obtained this. Uh, the first half of the course, all about the tech. The second half, all, all about practice management, portfolio construction, regulation, taxation, operations, compliance. Most importantly, how do you talk to your clients and answer other questions about this? Learn about it at DACFP.com. It's uh, $879 for the, for the entire course and really, really well worth it. I also want to let you know about DACFP Vision, our biggest live event of the year in person, June 13, 14 in Austin. Uh, among the other things we're going to be doing at this event, you're actually going to mint your own NFTs. Uh, it's going to be an awful lot of fun, uh, and you're going to learn a lot from the biggest leading uh, experts uh, in the crypto field. If you haven't yet read my number one Amazon bestseller named Book of the Year by the Institute, uh, or rather the Society for Business Journalists, uh, pick up a copy of The Truth About Crypto from your favorite bookseller. And if you're not listening to my daily podcast, you really need to start. Not just about crypto, but everything about your client's future, longevity, retirement security, exponential technologies, health and wellness. Tune into my daily podcast, five to 10 minutes a day, and you'll stay abreast of the latest and greatest. And if you want to reach me, here's how you do it. Uh, and I just want to say thanks so much, Matt Hogan and Ryan Rasmussen of Bitwise Asset Management. I encourage you to reach out to them at bitwiseinvestments.com. Did I get the web address right, Matt? You did. Great job, Rick. Uh, it's been a pleasure being with you both, Matt and Ryan. I'm Rick Edelman. Thanks for joining us on the program today. We'll see you next time.